In January of 2021, after making a call to a divorce attorney, a woman disappears in Chula Vista, California. With her husband as the prime suspect, and endless searches for her yielding no results, the case hinges on circumstantial evidence. Will the exhaustive evidence pointing towards a single suspect be enough to convict him of the alleged murder of his wife? This is the story of Maya Miliete. Detective Unit, we've got a really tough case before us. This case involves the topics of domestic violence, involves the topics of borderline possessive behavior on one side, and also the children are caught in the midst. That those are always the cases that are quite, quite sensitive to watch and to hear about. So if these are some of your triggers and something that you don't want to listen to today, I would say click out of this video or take it in smaller chunks, because this is a very heavy one, at least it was for me. So I'd like to tell you how I came about these stories. This one was in my recommended feed on YouTube, and it was the 48 hours coverage of Maya Miliette's disappearance. Now, I don't know if this happens to everybody, but when you watch the coverage of a story where a victim is your namesake, they share the same name as you, there's such an eerie spooky energy about the case, because, I don't know, it just feels so much more personal, like, hearing your name as the victim's name and, like, picturing what this person must have been going through. But also, why I found this story eerie is because we're going to speak about one of the most bizarre individuals, one of the spookiest people. Like, I don't know if you have ever gone into a room and sometimes you have a conversation with that specific person, right? Sometimes you don't even have to speak with them to know that you never want to see that person again. To know that that person is bad vibes, it's such bad energy, like, you don't want to be surrounded by them, like, you just don't want them in your presence. You're like, get the fuck out, get, like, you're bad energy. Like, you attract bad people, everything about you is just messed up. I don't want this energy in my life. I don't want it, I don't need it, just get out. That is, yes, one of the individuals that we're going to be speaking about. So, everything combined, I went to my researcher, Jeannie, who had done cult stories for this channel. Jeannie, I need to ask her if she wants me to share some of her details, and I will put them in the pinned comment for you if you need research for your own channel, because she does beautiful storytelling, just in general, but also she gives me then the insight on the US system on so many things in this story, because there's so many gaps that will probably be filled for us at trial. However, there's so many other questions that I have that I will be putting out there through this coverage. Maya's family also needs your help for the justice to be served in this case, so I will be leaving resources as well in the description, and also be putting it on screen, just how you can get involved after hearing her story. But to understand what type of crime might have happened here, and for what reason, we have to start from the beginning. Maya Talabansa, who went by May, was born on May the 1st, in 1981, in the Philippines, to her mom, Noemi, and her dad, Pablito. When she was 13, her family, including five siblings, would emigrate to the US. They moved to Honolulu in Hawaii. And that was in 1995, the family flourished in Hawaii. The siblings were very close, and Maya's best friend was her sister, Mary Chris, who is very vocal about justice for her sister, and I have a messy respect for her woman after having watched the 48 hours coverage, after seeing just her involvement here, this woman will not stop until she gets the justice for her sister. Maya was an excellent student, and she was described as both smart and incredibly kind. These descriptors would follow her through life. While in high school, Maya was working at a fast food restaurant as her after school job, and this is where she would meet a young man named Larry Ibaretta Miliete. This is where Jeannie in the script put Here is a news clip about Larry getting arrested at 15. Just so you don't get it confused, just so you don't think we are talking about a decent individual. Let's play that clip and then let me tell you a bit about Larry. The missing woman's husband was involved in a gang-related stabbing incident as a teenager. The defendant walked up to you and grabbed your arm? Yes. This 41-year-old man appeared in Chula Vista court this week on attempted kidnapping charges. The judge ordered us to blur his face. News 8 is following the case not because of his current charges, 
but because of what happened to him 24 years ago. In 1997, at the age of 17, he was the victim of a gang-related stabbing. And multiple sources tell News 8 the teenager who stabbed him was Larry Miliete, the husband of the now missing mother, Maya Miliete. I have reason to believe that he was in a gang. Attorney Billy Little is working with Maya's family to investigate the case. It's my understanding this was a uh, gang-related incident, that there were other multiple other people around. He was taken into custody as a juvenile. The stabbing happened on the evening of April 30th, 1997, near this McDonald's restaurant on Paradise Valley Road in the Bay Terraces neighborhood of San Diego. The teenage victim rushed to the hospital with multiple stab wounds, survived the attack. Larry Miliete, age 15 at the time of the stabbing, was arrested and booked in the juvenile hall on a charge of assault with a deadly weapon. It was a long time ago, and what you're looking for is, who is this person? Who has he grown to be? Has he learned from his past criminal conduct? Juvenile court records in the case are sealed, but after his release from Juvenile Hall, family members say Larry Miliete ended up moving to Hawaii with his parents. That's where he met his future wife, Maya, in high school. They married as teenagers, and Larry Miliete joined the Navy. Aside from a couple traffic tickets in Riverside County, Larry Miliete apparently had no more run-ins with the law. Larry and his parents had also emigrated from the Philippines, but they lived in San Diego first, and then in 1997, at 15 years old, Larry was arrested. The attack was labeled as gang activity, and it was near McDonald's on Paradise Valley Road in San Diego. The teenage victim did survive the attack, and they went on to a life of crime. Larry, however, went to juvenile detention, and he was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. His conviction and its outcome were sealed due to his juvenile status. Shortly after that, his parents moved the family to Hawaii, and this is how he would meet Maya. At the age of 18, Larry would join the Navy, and typically the US Navy did not accept recruits with arrest records, but because Larry was juvenile and the record was sealed, they may not have had the access to it. After 9-11, Ginny says the recruitment processes had changed for the Navy, but at this point that still wasn't the case, so Larry managed to join the Navy. One more comment on Larry's past from me. To give this man the benefit of the doubt, right? Like, according to that clip, if I managed to, to copyright to play it, um, he did leave the criminal past behind. Like, they say beyond some traffic tickets, he had no other charge to his name. So again, possibly, he had not committed any other crimes beyond the ones that he committed, maybe because, you know, he was on the streets, he somehow ended up joining some gang activity to prove his toughness, and then he just left that life behind. Something that he didn't seem to leave behind, one specific criminal act, was that fucking hairstyle. I have seen so many pictures of this man with different do, different little hairdo. He cannot pull any single hairstyle. What is this? What is this? I have never seen this in my life. Like, it just gets worse and worse. It's a talent in itself, okay? Had to be said. Had to be said. Now, on September 24th, 1981, when Larry was 18 and Maya was 19 years old, they would get married in Honolulu. Shortly after that, Maya and Larry would move to Southern California. Larry became an optician. An optician is an eye care professional that helps you choose the right eyeglasses or contact lenses, but not an eye doctor. They usually must be certified by the state they work in, with one to two years training, but are not doctors. To be clear, Larry was trained as an optician by the Navy and eventually employed at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. I love the subtle dig here by Jeannie. Just like, not the smartest individual, you know, let's just speak about the criminal record, then let's just speak how he's not a doctor. The same, however, could not be said for his wife, in terms of just the brilliance and the intelligence. 
Maya did not join the Navy. She did work for them as a contract specialist in Naval Surface Forces, though, naval base also in San Diego. She was a supervisor and she negotiated Department of Defense contracts for the Navy, which is a high-level job that required a lot of attention to detail. I let her family members and also co-workers Claudia and Allison talk about Maya and this period in her life. When Larry turned 18 and joined the Navy, the couple decided to get married. They were so young. Yeah. Teenagers. Yeah. She's the first one to get married, so it was a shock for everyone, but we respected her decision. Maya and Larry moved to Southern California and built their careers working for the Navy. Larry was an optician at the Naval Medical Center, and Maya worked as a supervisor contract specialist at this naval station in San Diego. She was my mentor from day one. She was like this little tiny person, but she was a big personality. Claudia Hulao and Allison Alexander worked with Maya at the base and became friends. We actually negotiate contracts for the U.S. Navy and she was very good at it. I used to, you know, joke around with her and, you know, because she had a photographic memory. I had a lot of respect for her. She was a very strong and confident leader. A lot of the women in the office really looked up to her. There was no glass ceiling. We could get wherever we wanted. Didn't matter where we came from. Her co-workers also said she had a photographic memory. And if this is something that you are not familiar with, it means the person can retain, usually with 100% accuracy, what they read or hear, or both. They also said she was a strong and confident leader, giving them each courage and support to do anything that they put their minds to. Maya and Larry waited 10 years to have children, and then they had two little girls and a younger son. Now, the children's names are available online. If you go to Help Find Maya, you can find the About Her page. You can obviously donate for the searches. You can get involved in searches if you are near California yourself and, like, volunteer. And the names of the kids are available on the page. I just really wanted their privacy protected. I believe the children are victims in this particular case, so I didn't want to have their names involved. So, as a family unit, they would do a lot of activities. They were quite active and quite outdoorsy. So, they would do things like camping, off-roading with four-wheelers, and the whole family loved being in nature. From what I have seen, Maya also loved recording these moments. But I never took them as fake. You know, like, sometimes with, like, family bloggers and stuff, it's just, like, so much focus on the kids and, like, it sounds so scripted. This was just, like, no, this is just a family outing. We're just hiking. This is, like, the beautiful scenery. The kids are there having fun. Me and Larry are having fun. It's, like, very, very wholesome, at least from what I have seen, at least from my perspective. Maya and Larry decided to wait 10 years before starting a family. The couple eventually welcomed two daughters and a son. It's a joy to see them, you know, that they have their own family too. We're always out camping. We're always outdoors. It's so pretty. Larry was a good dad. Always attentive to the kids. Like great parents. What kind of mother was she? Very caring, loving mother. She hands on. When they weren't outdoors, Maya also loved singing. She would sometimes post the videos of her singing on her YouTube channel, and she had a beautiful voice. And sometimes her son would sing with her. Just another, like, very, very cute moment. It was very clear that the kids were everything for her, meaning that she would never leave those children behind. She's um, always teaching them something, especially, you know, music. She has some videos with her son That's singing with her. Word by word. Yeah. Word by word. Brings us to tears every time we watch it. Maya's family said that Larry was always an attentive and good dad. 
He was always involved in their lives, in the family, and in the same tone, Maya was considered a great mom. It was always teaching her kids something. If it wasn't something outdoorsy, like how to set up camp, it would be something charitable. Or it would be something creative, like music, to have the creative release as really young kids. She just really wanted them to be children for as long as possible. And that brings us to 2021. Now that you know that the family loved being active and being outdoors, it will come as no surprise that in early 2021, Maya was planning a family skiing trip to celebrate her daughter's 11th birthday to Big Bear on Sunday, January the 10th. This, from the looks of it again, looks like a beautiful ski resort. It's very weird to think that it's also in California. Like, this would have been only 2 hours and 45 minutes away from their house, so it seemed like, you know, a quick ski trip, like something that the whole family will enjoy. And in the lead-up to the party, in the beginning of January, her family started not hearing from Maya as much. And this was very, very strange. Maya was very close to her siblings and parents. They all lived close enough that they visited often and they would talk daily. They had like a group family chat where they would exchange messages on a daily basis. January the 7th comes around and if you remember, the daughter's birthday is on the 10th. So just a couple of days away. And the family doesn't have a plan. They have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea if the ski resort is booked. What is the actual plan? Like, are they actually going? And this is very unlike Maya. But also what raised alarm bells in her sister Mary Chris's head was that she hasn't heard from her. You know, usually Maya would be on top of those things, but also very active in the family group chat. So, by January the 7th, her sister was just worried, so just worried sick, and she can't get in touch with Maya, so she gets one of Maya's brothers to stop by Marietta house in Chula Vista. The full address here is 2413 Paseo Los Gatos, and I'm including it because this will be the house that Maya was last seen at and disappeared from. And this is also the house that the police believe Maya was killed in for her not to tell us what's going to happen for her daughter's birthday. You know, that was a big deal. Mary Chris says when their brother JR drove over to check on Maya the next day, her husband Larry told him Maya had been in the bedroom for several hours. JR knocked on the door but got no response. We kind of just think, okay, maybe she's, just, maybe she's sleeping. Larry did say that they had an argument. He left it at that. We believed. Larry. They had an argument and she just, she just want to be left alone. On January the 8th, Maya's brother JR goes to the house to check on her. And according to the later arrest warrant, when JR came over, Larry told him that he and Maya had been in a fight, like they had a fight just the night before. JR talked to his nine year old niece at the time as well, who said that Maya had not been out of her room for about 11 hours. So it seems like they all thought Maya was in the house, but she just was in her room for the past 11 hours. She also told the brother that her and her sister had not been fed. Why have they not been fed? Where was Larry, you might wonder? Where Larry had his own story. At first, he told Maya's brother that he had been at work, and when he came home, he found that Maya was in her room and had been all evening. He had heard her in there, but had not seen her. Halfway through his story about being at work, Larry changed course, and he said that he had instead taken their four-year-old son to beach for the day. He had never gone to work, so he couldn't really account for Maya's whereabouts. So the brother is kind of like, this is odd, cool, like pinned that in the back of my head. However, then he goes to Maya's door and he knocks on the bed bedroom door, right? And he doesn't get the answer. So he leaves, because he later said he thought maybe Maya just needed some space. A couple of notes that I have had here on this particular part of the search warrant. I don't want you judging the family members in the comments. I will be deleting them. Any negative comments towards family are immediately going to be deleted. I will not even interact with them. So, you know, don't bother typing them up. Any guilt you might think they haven't gone through, they probably have. 
but also in terms of like the logic, right, by the brother here, by Mary Chris, by everybody. Maya and Larry had been married for over two decades. The 21st anniversary of their marriage was actually around the corner. So why wouldn't they believe what Larry was telling them? Why wouldn't they want to believe the husband? Like, they had had three kids. There were no reasons in their head to be like, okay, yeah, we had an argument, and then Maya was just having a break in her room. Second comment was, second comment I have had here, put it down, was about Larry and just how immediately he couldn't stick to one story and he knew like that he fucked up because of course when you say that you have been at work, right, and then you know that can be corroborated, like yeah, somebody like my boss is gonna be like no he hadn't, so he switched up the story right away saying like they have been to the beach. And the last comment, this is a story irks me in so many ways because Larry says he hadn't seen his wife the whole day. He just heard that she was in the room. But in the morning, he left two of his kids at home to technically fend for themselves. Like the comment about the kids not being fed is what like actually made my blood boil. I was like, did anybody feed these kids? Like, what do you mean? Like, what? You just heard, like, the kids haven't been fed. Larry, have you fed your fucking children? This man gives me the energy of a person who would, like, remarry, right? And then he would have kids with that new person and only love his biological children and not care for, like, his stepkids. He gives me, like, a very just, like, a surface level good father energy when it's like, oh, a boy, right? When it's like his son loves them. Girls, fuck it, let's let them fend for themselves. They're women. women, women belong in the kitchen. Or like the guy that just loves his biological children but doesn't care about the stepkids. It's just dead of the year over here. Like just grip had not been gotten. So we go into the next evening now. January the 9th, Mary Chris and her husband Richard come to the Miliette house. They came there obviously again because there was no sign of Maya. Like, there were no messages, nothing. And they noticed many things that they considered strange. The house was a mess, and generally things were very orderly and clean. Even though it was cold outside, it was about 56 degrees, that's 13 degrees Celsius, that evening Larry had the aircon on. Obviously the implication, he's airing out the house, because maybe he was bleached, maybe something had happened there. The following day, when there was still no news from Maya, Mary, Chris, and Richard drove over to the Miliette house. When we walked in, the house was a mess, which I've never seen their house messy. And it was cold. It was January. And we had the AC running, which was really odd. This time, Larry told them Maya was out. So, Larry says Maya's been where? Hiking. She went hiking. Larry had a different story this time around. Maya was not in the house. She was not in the room. She was not ignoring the whole family. She went hiking. This was nighttime, right? Like, Maya would go hiking. Like, she was, yes, very active, but usually it would involve the whole family. She wouldn't just dip on the girls, the boy, the husband. And also, she wouldn't have just gone hiking in the night. She was quite safe. And also, she wouldn't have gone hiking without making sure that the kids were fed, because the kids were again saying they haven't been fed. And also, she wouldn't have just gone hiking the night before her daughter's birthday. For his part, Larry again talked about the argument and said that he had seen her on the 7th, but they hadn't talked on the 8th or the 9th. So Mary Chris was suspicious of the entire story, including that Larry had changed his story from the 8th. And Mary Chris finally calls the Chula Vista Police Department to report Maya missing just before midnight on January the 9th, 2021. Because she was at the Miliette house while talking to the police and seemed hesitant on the phone to discuss details, the police would send officers out to do a welfare check. They did take the missing persons report as well just after the midnight on January the 10th, 2021. Suspicious that something wasn't right, Mary Chris reported her sister missing to the Chula Vista Police Department that night. How did the police react? They sent uh, three officers went to the house and they questioned us. Mary Chris and Richard were upset with what they say was a lack of concern from the police. It seemed like there was no urgency for the police department to investigate it properly. 
By January 10th, Maya had now been missing for three days. Her family gathered at her home to celebrate her daughter's birthday, hoping against hope. The next interview just made me sob because it's so heartbreaking to watch the interview with her sister, as you remember who raised the alarm bells, because Maya was planning the trip for her daughter's birthday, which was on January the 10th. On that day, they all gathered at the Miliate household, looking after the daughter and checking the door, knowing that if Maya was able to, she would never have missed this. Her family gathered at her home to celebrate her daughter's birthday, hoping against hope. We all like looking at the door, hoping she will walk in on her daughter's birthday. She never did. I feel so bad. <laughs> After that, she said, Mommy didn't show up for my birthday. <laughs> I didn't know how to comfort her. <laughs> Mommy didn't show up for my birthday were the words of her 11-year-old daughter. You see it on my face, you see it on the interviewer's face, you see it at your own reflection in the mirror right now. We are fuming. We are fucking fuming. You know who isn't? Dad of the year over there. Because one of Meyer's brothers, or was it Richard? Richard, actually, um, so Mary Chris's husband, took a picture of Larry when they were at the house, when the birthday party, which is probably the saddest birthday party because they all think that Maya is just gone and something had happened to her, Richard takes a picture of Larry and Larry looks just relaxed. He's just leaning against the desk, looks just incredibly chilled. And even some people say like he's eerily, like it looks like he's smiling in this picture. There's just not a worry in the world in this man's head. This picture to me is so reminiscent of like the first interview with Chris Watts. I don't think they had interviewed him or at least that's public. The police had actually had like a video interview with him. But it's just, you remember like when yeah Chris Watts gave that first interview and everybody watching, you know, like the police officers who have then later been interviewed, they were like, oh no, we like definitely knew we were in the presence of somebody who is guilty of something just based on his demeanor. It's just like the cool, calm, collected individual when everybody else is freaking out. And everybody's like, yeah, we are in the presence of evil, like, but this can be used then later to just prove that to the rest of the world, so we are just gonna go along with it and let the man speak. That's kind of like the energy that I'm getting just looking at this picture. The same night, Maya's co-workers, Claudia and Allison, found out that Maya was missing. Claudia had been out for dinner and drinks with Maya and Larry, she spent time with the family as well, so she went directly over to the house, and it was nighttime, so the party was over. She later said the family was outside with kids, babies, elderly, trying to organize what would be the first search for Maya, and they did it on their own. Now, Jeannie and me, like, we don't want to criticize, right, Chula Vista Police Department, but from at least the 48 hours coverage, from everything we have seen online, every search that had been done for Maya in the last two years had been set up by the family and manned by volunteers. At least, that's what we have seen. They are basically asking for donations and funding these searches themselves, which again isn't something that a family or somebody who is missing should be doing. However, I don't see that the police is pulling any resources into this. So that night, the family went out into the dark, onto the hiking trails near the Miliate house, searching with flashlights. No sign of Maya was ever found. As you'd remember, Maya worked for the Navy, and she was generally the nicest human being that you would meet, who would leave a really great impression on everybody. So, four days after she was declared missing, January the 11th, Billy Little, a former criminal investigator for the Navy, was asked by his wife to help. He later said that she knew of Maya from her work with the Navy, and he helped because that's what you do. He was a retired investigator, but he knew the steps. 
so he went to the Milieta house, where she had been seen last. From what I could find, this house will only be searched by the police in May of 2021, and we still don't know what had been found. I suspect it will come during the trial proceedings, if anything, like, you know, by the prosecution to, like, nail down the prime suspect, but still I couldn't see anything like blood spatter, was there any signs of violence, was there any signs that something actually happened to Maya at this house. But in our timeline, Billy meets Larry, the husband. Little wanted to talk to Larry Miliette. Amongst other things, he had found it odd that Maya's husband wasn't the one who initially called the Chula Vista Police Department. In fact, when the family wanted to call 911, he discouraged it. Were there police around also investigating at this point? No, no. According to the family, the police had come, he had given them, I guess, the same story. In news reports at the time, a Chula Vista police spokesperson stated that Larry was being cooperative. They were treating it as a missing persons case and had found no indication of foul play. What first bothered the investigator was that Larry wasn't the one who reported Maya missing. Larry didn't really have an answer for that. At that time, the press was saying that Larry was cooperating and foul play was not suspected. But Billy said he knew from the family, and even Larry, that the couple's last interaction had been an argument. So he looked for physical evidence of that. He did not see any defensive wounds on Larry, no scratches or anything on his arms or hands. But there was damage to the house that looked related to domestic violence. I'm going to let Billy tell you about his initial conclusions and the damage that he found on the house. Defensive wounds on his hands, which I don't see. But Little says he did see something outside the Miliete bedroom. We went upstairs where her bedroom was. The first thing I noticed was the hole in the door, right next to the handle, because it's right in the area where if you need access to a locked room, you're going to punch right through there. And I touched the patch, and it felt new. It felt wet. I made a comment to Larry about, hey, what's this? And he says, oh, yeah, uh, Maya punched a hole in the door there. Inside the bedroom, Little says he noticed another hole on the wall that also appeared to have been recently repaired that would have been too high for Maya to punch because she was small, right? And I said, Larry, what about this hole? And he said, oh yeah, she uh, got mad punched that too. Larry's creating a picture here of a woman who is violent. Is this adding up to you? No. None of this story is adding up. When you left the house that day after collecting those puzzle pieces, what were you thinking? I thought Larry killed her, and we need to find out what he did and what he did with the body. But I wasn't ready to tell Mary Chris yet, because I didn't know, right? I could be wrong. Billy said that when he got to the room that Maya was sleeping in, and yes, Ginny made a note here, they were sleeping in separate rooms, there was an obvious patch from a recent hole in the wall near the door. He touched the wall, and it was still sticky where it had been patched. He said it was at a level where a person might punch a hole in the wall to open a bedroom door from the outside that was locked. When he asked Larry about it, he blamed it on Maya and said that she would get angry and punch a hole in a wall. Inside the bedroom, there was another freshly patched hole that was too high for Maya to reach. She was too short. But again, Larry had said that Maya had done it. I just want this as a pin in the back of your head. The, the way that Larry wants his wife depicted as, as a villain, as a possible abuser, possibly she was the one who was violent. You see, there's no scratches on my hands. She was the one who, like, did all of that. Because something tells me that this is possibly what he might use in the future. After Billy finished with Larry, he started canvassing the neighborhood for video footage and information. And this was crucial. And I believe, like, some of this, like, paints such a good picture without certain evidence that Billy had found, we wouldn't be able to have a storyline that flows in this case. 
a lot of people have had home security systems with audio and video, and this neighborhood was of course no exception. He said he knew it was important that the information be preserved now, before it was deleted or recorded over. So he found several important items. Two of them were video and one was audio only. The first was a video of Miliette Street on the 7th and 8th and shows their vehicles. On January the 7th at 4.42 p.m., Maya is seen returning home from work and parking her Jeep Rubicon in front of the house. She goes inside and this is the last time that she's ever seen alive. Then, on the morning of January the 8th, at 5.58 a.m., Larry is seen moving his Lexus GX460 and it was already backed into the driveway, facing out towards the street. So Larry could have just backed out and then started driving, but that's not what he does. He moves the car, repositions it, and backs it partially into the garage. And due to the angle, detectives that later viewed the footage were unable to see into the garage or the Lexus. Then, because he was already up bright and early, repositioning his car, he had to go somewhere. And as he will correct himself, he didn't go to work. At 6.45 that same morning, Larry is seen driving away in the Lexus and does not return to the house until 6.06 p.m. He was gone for over 11 hours. It was Friday. I googled it to see that it was indeed a working day. His kids are being homeschooled and not fed for almost 12 hours. There must be a solid reason for that. What possible explanation could have Larry had for leaving? His alibi, or the explanation to the police, according to the arrest warrant, is that he was at Torrey Pines State Beach, which is approximately four miles from Solano Beach. That's 29 to 33 minutes from the house that they have uh, lived in in Chula Vista. It was January, and even in California, the beach was cold with the ocean breeze. The high was 63 with a low of 50 degrees on that day. Celsius, we are speaking like 10 to 15 degrees. He said he had his four-year-old son at the beach for 11 hours. We will speak about that. Trust me, I have gone into like everything that I had known about psychology of like four-year-olds and have placed myself into four-year-old's shoes so many times in this story. I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. four-year-old me, the beach, the whole day. Yeah, that seems, that seems like I would be distracted a lot. Like, I would be impatient and want to do more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From an arrest warrant, we have a bit of an insight as to what the older girls were doing as Larry is seemingly chilling on the beach for 11 hours with his son. The older two children were in virtual school and told detectives that Maya would normally check on them periodically throughout the day while they're learning online. However, on this day, January the 8th, Maya didn't do that. So the older two kids would say that they last saw Maya on Thursday, January the 7th, which aligns with the last time that she had parked her car, like the last footage from the neighborhood CCTV cameras that she was seen in. So that also tracks, and the children heard noises in the kitchen on Friday, January the 8th, and assumed that it was Maya, but they had actually never seen her. To give Larry the benefit of the doubt and see how his story, his actual alibi works, right? So it's a Friday. The older two kids, the girls, are at home, they are being homeschooled, so they have to log in online and attend school. They know when they should get up, they can, you know, just log in themselves, they've done it before, and, and their mom is definitely at home. Yes, they have had a fight, Larry had not seen her, but he had heard her. He knows she's just, like, in her room, chilling, but of course she's going to, like, eventually get up, prepare breakfast for the girls, then lunch, they will definitely be fed, she will check up, like, if they're doing their homework, if they are actually attending their lessons. Cool, he has all the freedom to be the father of the year over here and take his son to the beach for over 11 hours. He's just going to take a day off. He is not going to, you know, call in sick or anything. He's not going to let anybody at work know anything because his son had to go to the beach. But, but, his alibi, if you're thinking about it, can be easily corroborated, right? 
car records, GPS, his phone records. Let it will be cleared, getting that of the year award over here. Or will he? Because initially, he would tell the police that he took his phone to the beach. But records will show that Larry's phone was off from 6.45 a.m. to 18.34, so 6.34 p.m. Once the GPS records report was generated, it indicated a navigation event on January the 8th at 3.59 p.m. for Larry's home address. The system didn't capture any additional locations or routes traveled on that day. So investigators have been unable to confirm Larry's whereabouts on January the 8th. We'll go into more detail, especially about the car, in a bit. A couple of comments here. It was very uncharacteristic for his phone to be switched off for literally over 12 hours, especially like as he's a dad, um, has to, you know, show up for work or give them an excuse, why not? Also has a wife. All of that is very, like, uncharacteristic based off of the previous history that they have had after obviously taking his phone and, like, checking for inactivity before to see, like, if this is a pattern of behavior. Couple of my own comments on this part, like, I find it very telling that he switched off his phone and didn't use the navigation system to input any other address but his home at 3.29 p.m. The picture that's painted for me is that when this whole car positioning, right, Larry would have allegedly done something to his wife overnight, moved the body in the morning, and then, again, allegedly disposed of it somewhere to a location that probably he knew well. So this is my thought process, because the very first thought to me was that he knew it well. Like, he would know how to drive to this location and drive from it. Instinctively, that was my first option. So let me walk you through two options that I see in my head, and you can tell me what you think about it in the comments. Option number one, Larry knew of the disposal site because they were outdoorsy, they would off-road, because he knew how to drive to this place for whatever reason, and then he thought, well, I switched my phone off, and it will look suspicious if I don't put anything into my car GPS. So at 3.30, he puts his home address in. The second option is he was actually lost. So maybe he went to the beach first, then told his kid, we're just gonna drive around. Remember how like we used to do this, like as a family, like we would off-road, we're going to just drive about. He chose a disposal site that even he could not find after which he was lost and then checked how to get him and his son home. This might make more sense if looking at the time. So he puts his home address in at 3.29, and he got home about two and a half hours after this. So in terms of time, that might make more sense, because the time matches up from like when he actually input the address to the time that he actually got home. If you are screaming at me right now, like, Maya, GPS, like, if they know that he put the address back home, like, they must know the location that he was at when he put that address. We'll cover it later. It's a very disappointing answer, okay? There is a sp spot, like, in the story where that part makes a lot more sense. But this reminded me of the Kara Rintala case that I covered, and I'm following the fourth trial that is now to, like, give you guys an update, at least, like, as a pinned comment under that case coverage. But we have to take the psychology of the passenger in, a four-year-old son. The gaps I have in this story is I couldn't find if the kids were interviewed. So, from the arrest warrant, I feel like the police had spoken to the kids, but I don't know if this is, you know, like, recorded, like, how much they could actually get from, again, like, a four-year-old kid. Like, were these interviews, like, done in the form of a transcript, are they going to be in trial? We just don't know. But to corroborate, if they made any detour locations, like, how many hours were they actually on the beach, the youngest kid would be crucial here, because he was actually in the car with his dad the whole day. I believe this was done intentionally, because obviously the older two kids have to attend online school. They have to show up, they have to log in. 
Whereas also the kid that is in the car with you is young, they're four years old. You can tell them whatever and they will buy your story. It is also very easy to distract a four-year-old kid. You can just tell them like, hey, we just make this little pit stop and then I will buy you a treat and then we spend the whole day on the beach. Or you'll tell them we're just gonna go to the beach and then we go drive around for a couple of hours so that you know that the kid is not gonna be bored. So like if somebody, anybody questions them, they're gonna be like, no, we we're just at the beach and we were driving and, you know, like no alarm bells will go on in the child's head where they'll be like, no, actually daddy stopped for like a very long time to do something that I was not supposed to know. I hope the police actually interviewed all of the kids and that this information comes out during trial because the police is truly letting everybody do the work here at this point before they wake the hell up. Meaning, let us go back to Billy and the work that he had done for this family. So in our timeline, Billy is still doing the work of recovering the recordings while the family is covering the grounds searching for Maya. Another item that Billy found from a neighbor was a recording of the Milieta children out in their backyard at 10.30 p.m. on January the 7th. This was a school night, again, like, Thursday night, and like we said, it was cold. But there was an audio of the children in the backyard late that night. It was recorded on the neighbor security system, and this was not normal for these kids. They would be in bed at normal times. ...of the Milieti children playing in the yard at 10.30 p.m. on the night their mother was last heard from. <laughs> on a school night, and it's cold outside, and the weather, I believe it was in the high 40s that night. Again, this corroborates the story that something happened inside the house the night before. Larry lets the kids sleep while he possibly cleans up the scene. Then the whole saga of the car, switching the phone off, and beach alibi happens the next day. The recordings uncovered paint a very clear picture of what had happened. Once the police gets the warrants to search the car and the house, they should find the evidence to further corroborate this and make the story flow even easier. But one thing we are yet to talk about would be the motive. Why would this man, who apparently left crime behind when he was a teenager, who loved his kids and his wife, all of a sudden decide to kill his wife and the mother of his kids? To find out about the darker, side of Larry, we need to look into the arrest warrant. It's time for me to tell you it is his arrest warrant. I think like everybody looking at me right now is like, yeah, bitch, we got that. We, we gauge that. We gauge that. So, Larry, as we will know, uh, didn't go to work on January the 8th because he was at the beach, father of the year, let's go. But he also didn't go to work on January the 6th or the 7th. Now that's a bit suspicious because he also didn't give his boss a reason, he didn't say he was sick. Nobody actually knew why uh, Larry was not at work. Well, I'm, I'm lying. He did give a boss one justification, and this was the screenshots between Maya and Larry. The arrest warrant doesn't actually tell us when these screenshots were sent to the boss, to Larry's boss, but I think it's in the aftermath for him to kind of justify why he didn't show up at work for three days. So let me read out to you the exact like wording of the arrest warrant here. The messages indicate that Maya was seeking a divorce and Larry was unraveling. On January the 8th, Larry's family and boss were looking for him and could not find him. In fact, Larry's boss sent a message to May the morning of the 8th saying he was concerned because he hadn't heard from Larry, stating, this is not like him to miss work, it has been a few days. Larry's dad also sent him a message saying, Larry, please turn on your phone because Terry, your boss, is calling regarding your job. Based on the evidence, no one apart from Larry and at the time, his four-year-old son knew where he was on January the 8th. Back to our timeline, we now have a bit of a clearer picture of what happened on the 7th and then on the 8th, thanks to Billy and Maya's family. Some recordings were uncovered and on January the 14th, Larry is going to speak up for the first time. As the friends, family and neighbors are searching for Maya at the Mount San Miguel Park, Larry Miliete had a phone interview with local media. 
I'm going to play this in two parts and then kind of tell you my opinion once we play each part. I think one, but the last time you saw her was like last Thursday, I think. Um, visually, but um, she was in the house Friday. Oh, okay, so it was Friday. I mean, kind of just, you know, it's been almost a week now, and mm -hmm. you haven't seen from her, you haven't heard, you haven't seen her or heard from her. You have three daughters or three kids with her. I mean, this isn't like her. No, not this long. Um, it's the concerning and alarming part is uh, she wouldn't be gone this long. What, you guys were married 21 years? Well, it'll be 20, 21 years, uh, May 21st of this year. So 20 years, it'll be 21 this year. Wow. What do you yeah, love about Maya? Oh, I love everything about her. She's um, very smart, um, kind, uh, you know, basically just her, herself, her personality, her smell, just everything. Probably your love for life, she loves to hike, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. She, you know, just her outgoing personality. And probably a great mom. Oh, yes, yes, she is. Her smell. He says he misses her smell. And I don't know if you noticed, but the interviewer is immediately like, that, that, that's it? Like, you're just like, oh, yeah, she was, like, really pretty and she smelled nice. Like, that's it? He, she literally fills him in and is like, the mother of my kids, the, the wife of 21 years, like, say something that makes you not sound like a sociopath. Like, say something to evoke emotion in the public that's listening to this to want to help you out, Larry. Oh, this part of me is such a wrong way. So, I mean, why do you think what do you think happened? I mean, there's no reason that you can think of, of, you know, why she wouldn't be here, be here for her kids. She wouldn't miss her daughter's birthday. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to speculate. There's a lot of speculations and, you know, people kind of like throw these, um, uh, I don't know, speculations out. But right now, um, I just want to focus on how, you know, to get her back home safe and sound and, um, yeah, that's it. And then have always given any indication yeah. at all about where she is? Oh, uh, no. Right now, but they, you know, I have full confidence. And like I said, uh, the CVPD and the Navy, um, because they, they put maximum resources on our case. So, you know, this is what they do. This is what they do best. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, they're going to do their job, and um, that's why I'm really hopeful and confident that, you know, um, things will work out. How are your kids taking that? Uh, that's my main focus for now. Um, that's why I'm very thankful for um, my, uh, my sister-in-law, Mary Chris, because she's handling all this media attention. She's actually doing everything that I should be doing, you know, out there. But at the same time, I'm just making sure, you know, it's as normal, like a normal day for them. Um, you know, they do their school, their, their, mainly their main routine um, is just kept. And, you know, I've been doing this for a while since she's been missing, and she, they're still happy-go-lucky um, most of the time. I know they sense something is wrong, but, you know, I minimize that. Um, they don't really understand the gravity of it, but I know my oldest, my two oldest kind of, like, sees it. But I try to minimize the impact that it has on them. But although, even though I'm trying to do that, I notice, you know, there's... You know, they, they know what's going on. Well, yeah, because they were down at the vigil, weren't they? Yes. Uh, I had my oldest down there for a little bit, and then um, my uh, second youngest had tutoring, so I had to get her to come in, and, you know, and then they had piano today, uh, which they missed because I, I allowed them to go to the park. So I, and I, you know, I was like, wow. And when I got to see a little bit of it, I was just overwhelmed and thankful for all the support. I was like, this is, you know, from my wife, Maya, and it's, uh, you know, strangers, but, um, you know, most of the time on TV, I mean, you see all the bad parts, but you don't see all the good, the good parts where, you know, these, there's still good people out there, and they, you know, they really do care. I know, it's like, I get that you didn't come just because you had to, was it just like for privacy reasons, or? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just, um, again, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, that person to like basically you know go out there but um 
don't know, just, I just want to make sure it's focused on my wife, you know, finding my wife, not nothing else. And I just don't want any distractions from that. Well, Larry, thank you so much. And like I said, I'm hoping, you know, with this story, hopefully it can be out every day. And yes, ma'am. Just to continue, you know, to see if there's any kind of findings. Because, yeah, police say that there's been, like, no digital footprint of her at all, which is really odd. Um, you know, I, you know, police just say that there's no crime at all. But it's like, where the heck is she? Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is the disheartening part. The disheartening part is, uh, you know, it's been really a really long time. And, you know, this is... Uh, you know, it's the, I don't know what to uh, think about that. It's just surreal, basically. That, you know, you see this stuff on the news, but you don't, you don't know how it is until, you know, it happens to you, so. Do you think people are unfairly, you know, questioning you or suspecting you? Um, no, I mean, you know, they got to do their job, I understand. So, you know, whatever it takes. Um, they have to, you know, look at any lead or, um, basically they just got to cover all their, uh, all the protocols and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's part of the job, I guess. What about the public that don't even have to Yeah, that's the thing about the media part, you know, um, it's upsetting sometimes that, you know, people, you know, make implications and. It's, uh, you know, without even asking, you know, like domestic violence, I'm like, really? I guess I, her brothers are here, her three brothers, and they know uh, our relationship. I've, I've always been open to the family about our relationship, and they know I've never touched her sister. So they're like, yeah, the media is, sometimes they don't get their story straight before putting it out there. Or it's just maybe, uh, un, you know, uh, unresponsible uh, journalist or whatever. But we get it. I mean, you know, whatever makes the biggest impact. Um, to get the story or get the viewer's attention. So, again, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you get the viewer's attention, you get their interest, and, you know, you get the story out. They're like, oh, I'm interested. Now they're following it, you know? And I'm thankful for that because whatever promotes uh, helping find my wife, Maya, you know, um, whatever it takes, basically. So, um, like my sister-in-law said, she doesn't care what it takes just as long as she comes home safe, and I agree. And so, you know what, you just do what you got to do. You know, and even though, you know, um, uh, you know, some of it's not all good, whatever, like I said, whatever it takes to bring her home. It's... In this second bit, he says how he wants his children to live the life of normalcy, like how he is basically like pretending every day. It's like, oh yeah, no, I'm here, I'm helping out with the kids while Mary Chris is out there doing the searches, right? Where allegedly, right, if he is responsible for anything that happened, to Maya. She didn't appear for her daughter's birthday. There is no normalcy. Like, they had all been there at the saddest birthday party looking at the door, being like, my mommy didn't show up for my birthday. There is no normalcy. Like, I just do not understand what happens in this man's brain where he thinks like, oh no, 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 we are just pretending and the kids are believing like everything is totally fine, where suddenly they haven't seen their mother for days on end. Also, the only time that his voice doesn't sound as controlled, at least personally to me again, is when he mentions the media looking into the domestic violence, right? He kind of says, it feels like that's the only time he went a bit off script, of like what he was planning to say. And he says like, well, yeah, they're gonna do whatever they do to like investigate, you know, eliminate me, and then they will hopefully focus on somebody else. And one last thing, he mentions Mary Chris and Maya's family, but especially the sister, right? And personally, just it looks like he's trying to be in their good books, to say like her brother would know that I would never hit her sister, Mary Chris is out there conducting searches, and I'm, you know, out here taking care of the kids. There was, there's always that pretense that he's the part of the family, they're doing it all together. Whereas Mary Chris and the family are going to say like, no, he just never participated in the searches. He just never bothered to search. Because again, in Larry's mind, probably, like according to many people's perspectives, why search for somebody that he doesn't want to be found? That pretense might have lasted for a few weeks until on January the 23rd, 2021, the Chula Vista Police Department conducts a search 
of the Milieta house. Prior to this, Larry had initially allowed them to speak with the kids. He had also allowed them to access his cell phone. And one problem with his phone was that many of his texts with and about Maya were deleted, but not all. Not every text on every phone, and they could tell. The reason they conducted the search was that they also, when checking through his cell phone, found two pictures on Larry's phone of a large number of weapons. Mostly guns, assault rifles, in the Miliete Master bedroom. The amount of guns, rifles in particular, that you see in these pictures is alarming, but what is most alarming is that one of the pictures has his youngest child, their son, surrounded by these guns. And because my dumbass just doesn't know enough about weapons and the guns that we are seeing in these pictures, Jeannie summarized this for me, and also for some of you that are oblivious, so let me read that out. Most of the guns that you see in these pictures are legal. In the US and in the most states, guns, even classified as assault rifles, are legal, if they have the proper specification for the state that the person lives in, and if they are legally owned. When the police searched, they seized two Glock handguns, a rifle, a shotgun, and an illegal assault weapon. It was illegal because it was a non-California-compliant configuration. As the case gathered steam in the media, on January 23rd, 2021, two weeks after Maya's disappearance, the Chula Vista Police Department searched the Miliete house. And what they did find was that Larry had a lot of firearms. They seized two Glock handguns, a rifle, and a shotgun. And they found that he was in possession of an illegal assault weapon. Investigators also downloaded images from Larry's phone. Three days later, the police were back. There were, however, four registered firearms to Larry that were not at the house, and he refused to tell them where they were, only saying that he gave them to a friend. Detectives would later learn that Larry gave them to his uncle to store them for him, because he knew that law enforcement was coming. The possession of the illegal assault rifle was a felony that the police would eventually charge Larry with. And we'll get back to the weapons, because this saga is not over. But what you need to know in terms of the weapons here so far is that one of them was illegal. Well, having one of them you know, from those pictures was illegal because it wasn't compliant with the state where he was living in, so it wasn't compliant to California. And then there were also four registered firearms that he had just given to somebody, and that will present a whole as problem point for Larry as we go along. But in the meantime, we're going back to the timeline and the searches for Maya pick up the pace in February. The Chula Vista Police Department and Maya's family would hold a press conference on February the 5th, pleading for help to find Maya. Please bring her home, her sister Mary Chris would say. If you have any information, please help us find my sister. Since Maya's disappearance, a group called Help Find Maya has been out searching for her most weekends. The group has searched areas in Anza Borrego Desert State Park, Otay Lakes, and Merritt Valley Road. You can look up for updates on the website, join as a volunteer, or just read a compilation of interviews and articles highlighted by her family. There's so many people that join the searches as this family moved them. Even if your only motivation is to nail the person who did harm to Maya, it's good enough to join the search team. Besides not going to work, blaming it on a possible divorce, the concerning amount of rifles in the house, in our timeline, Billy is actually hearing from the friends and co-workers that there were some marital problems that started in January of 2020, and within a few months, Larry was just beyond possessive and spiraling out of control. So let us talk about Maya and Larry's relationship behind the closed doors. On January 26th, they served another search warrant, and the police take the navigation system, the GPS, from Larry's Lexus. Meanwhile, Maya's friend had been revealing details about the couple's relationship. I would say March or so of 2020, the obsession became obvious. Larry's behavior had grown alarming before his wife went missing. He would do subliminal messages for her to be that perfect spouse. And it was everywhere she walked, 
at different times they would turn on. That it's insane. It sounds like from a movie. Maya's family and her friends say that a couple's marriage had changed and deteriorated in 2020. And remember, this is the beginning of the pandemic and lockdown in the US, so there was a major uptick in intimate partner violence and assaults on children. There will be one account of Larry at some point possibly being violent to Maya during this year. One of Maya's friends said that Maya told her Larry choked her to the point where she was unconscious. I just heard that. Oh, I was mad. I could lead to that. Maya had never shared that with Mary Chris. She didn't share what she's going through because she didn't want the family to worry about her. She was also protecting Larry and she was protecting the children. Were you aware of any physical abuse? No. No. She would say little things here and there, but not always to the same person. They were already incidents that were huge red flags. That if we all knew it at the same time, it would have been a bigger picture. I feel guilty at the, you know, after the fact, once she went missing, it, it was a very harsh reality for me. I wasn't able to help her and I will forever live with that. One of Maya's friends later reported to the investigators that she told them a disturbing story a few months before she disappeared. Larry wasn't always violent, but there was a time when he choked her to the point where she passed out. She never told her family members, and it was a secret she wasn't ready to share. There were so many red flags that nobody could see the full picture. What we know for sure is that in January of 2020, Larry starts calling Maya's family to ask for help with Maya. He asked them to intervene on his behalf to help him save his marriage. He told them he believed Maya was having a midlife crisis. He complained that she was going out with friends too much, and these were single friends. God forbid a woman has single friends. Criminal offense. But Maya was telling her family the problem wasn't with her, that it was with Larry. They later said they felt caught in the middle, but supported Maya completely. Claudia, Maya's friend and co-worker, later said that during this time she started hearing concerning calls between Maya and Larry calls that she considered controlling. So Larry would like ring up Maya, asking her like, why did she take too long to get between the car and the office? And she's like, how the fuck do you even know that? Like, why was she stopping to talk to somebody, you know, like between going from the office and back home? Like, why did it take her unusual amount of time to get through traffic? Larry also started stopping by Maya's work at random times to try to catch her doing something wrong. Her family said he wanted her to be the same submissive person that she used to be, but she was growing, changing, and getting stronger. My comment here is, they married really young, right? Like, Larry was 18, Maya was 19. And obviously, I don't know, the normal, right, like, course of life is you get married, like, if you want to have kids, like, yes, you have kids. And then once those kids are grown, like, you can go back to, like, nurturing different friendships, different like relationships that you have your own relationship and obviously that seems like what Maya was doing here right like yeah she was maybe not like constantly at home because the kids were not as small or again like she would go and have a coffee with a friend of hers that like she had known and worked with forever like fucking criminal offense but this guy always had that thing of like, oh no, well, when she married me, she was young and she was behaving differently. Why is she not behaving in the same way that she behaved as a teenager now like 20 years into the marriage? Because that's not how life works. Because that's just not fucking normal. Like what you're expecting somebody to behave as a teenager and somebody to behave at like 39 is not normal. It's not normal for you to expect them to act the same. I don't know, it just had to be said because Nobody mentions, like, just how young they were when they married and how, like, obviously it's not going to be the same relationship at this point on. It doesn't mean that she's doing anything wrong. In fact, he's doing everything 
drunk himself. So further into 2020, Larry starts tracking Maya's spending and hacking into her social media accounts. At this point, she has no privacy from him. He has accused her of having affairs and even wrote an email to her boss about this, knowing that this could definitely get her fired. He told her family that she was sinful and asked for their help to get her back into church. And it started back in January of 2020 when they started having marital problems. Larry will call every single one of us trying to ask for help to intervene, you know, into the marriage. Larry was complaining that Maya was having a midlife crisis. He said, well, she's been going out with her friends more often and she has a lot of single friends. But my sister is saying, you know, it's not me, it's, it's Larry. Maya's friend Claudia spent time with the couple socially. His relationship was very kind of to the side and just very watchful. From what my observation of him, he always had to be in control. Claudia recalls an instance when Larry couldn't get a hold of Maya at work. You know when somebody might be agitated or you overhear their voice? I did hear, where are you? It takes you this long to get from your car to your office. Who were you talking to? He wants her to be submissive for her to comply to him, to be the same person as, you know, she used to. But Maya's loved ones say that Maya was changing. She was growing into someone new, a strong woman, for sure. As the months passed in 2020, Larry's grip on Maya tightened. He's now tracking her spending habits. He's gotten into all of her social media accounts. She doesn't have any privacy. And he suspected that she was straying. Larry accused her of having affairs with several men at work, wrote emails to her boss at work. He knows that if he tells the boss that she's having an affair with somebody at work, that she will get fired. He tells all of Maya's family, she's cheating, she's sinful, help me get her back on the Christian religious way and starts forcing her to go to church. These are texts that Larry sent to Maya's family. And he's quoting the Bible, and it says, For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. He's talking about Maya. In his own words, he said that he was getting desperate, and he felt that the devil was tempting him. At some point, Maya's family says they told her they were concerned about what was unfolding. At that time, we knew that my sister is ready to move on. Larry would start sending horrible texts to her family about how she was an adulterous whore, where he used several Bible quotes to back up his position. He texted her brother, I'm just getting really desperate. I think the devil is tempting me. Again, her family said that they were supporting Maya, who said she was moving closer to the idea of divorce. But Larry's desperation had started to scare them. We see the typical abuser approach here from Larry, where he's trying to isolate Maya so that the only thing that she has is him, right? Like bad-mouthing her to her family, so that the family is like, well, Larry must be right, he lives with her, he must be seeing all these things, what if this affects, like, the way that Maya is as a person or as a mother? He then sends, like, the threats, um, well, rather, like, lies to her boss, meaning that there is a threat of her losing her job again, bed bowing her to everybody else so that the only person she could turn to is him. And we have a clear escalation between September and December 2020, with stalker-like behavior that by December time made Maya certain that she wanted a divorce. Google searches on Maya's electronic devices reveal that by December 2020, she was searching how to calculate child support payments, how much mortgage can I afford, indicating that she was conducting research to begin a life separate from her husband. So we spoke about the overbearing texts, questions about why she doesn't respond right away, control of her social media and spending, getting the family involved to help get her on the right way, but the information that Billy Little found in March of 2023, however, has shown that Larry had gone desperate. Larry Miliete had turned to witchcraft. Weird flags, just on the surface, because if you're thinking somebody's cheating on you, you know, somebody is adulterous, like, usually by default, you know, historically, then that person is a witch. Mm -mm. 
not by Larry's uh, standards. He started contacting people who appeared from their online uh, reviews and websites to sell spells. His cell phone data download would reveal that Larry sent hundreds of emails to various companies that appear to sell spells. The investigation would reveal that these companies' purpose is to be psychics, spirit channelers, and or white light practitioners capable of energy work, who sell spells that can be cast to enhance a person's love life, eliminate death, or make a romantic partner remain faithful. Larry would purchase numerous spells to cast on Maya. He used a beautiful picture of him and Maya together, splattered it with blood, and made a blood altar. By the fall of 2020, Billy Little says Larry was growing increasingly desperate to hold on to Maya. And so what does he do? He goes to uh, witchcraft. There are people on the internet that'll sell you for five bucks, you know, how to make a spell that will get her to be attracted to you, to bind your marriage in blood. And that's what he tried to do. Does low witchcraft blood altar. That is the picture that he took of the altar, an old photo of them with blood thrown on it. Little says Larry contacted numerous spellcasters and even wrote a review for one. And he writes of this spellcaster, she is kind, professional, and courteous. My casting has not yet manifested, but I'm really hoping and counting on it. Leaving a review like one would leave on Yelp for a food order. Like it's an Uber ride. And he's like, got oh, five stars. Good job, spellcaster. So he's not quite as smart as he thinks he is. He doesn't realize that all of that stuff is pointing the finger at him. Between September 2020 and January 2021, Larry contacted these websites daily, sometimes multiple times a day, purchasing spells and sending messages requesting help so that Maya would obey him, fall back in love with him, and to incapacitate her or make her sick so that she could not leave the house. Specifically, one message from Larry on December the 27th stated, please punish Maya and incapacitate her enough so she can't leave the house. It's time to take the gloves off. December the 31st, Larry sends another email to a spellcaster indicating that they were in the desert, dirt biking and off-roading for several days, and asked, can you hex to have her hurt enough that she will have to depend on me and need my help? She is only nice to me when she needs me or is sick. Thanks again, maybe an accident or a broken bone. Meanwhile, it's probably safe to presume Maya didn't know her husband was full-blown hexing her, because that's, again, not something that you think about, right? You're like, okay, yes, he is definitely presenting signs of somebody possessive. He is clearly, like, very controlling, overbearing, I'm not about this life, but you never think, like, oh, yeah, he is going online, contacting spellcasters, and then reviewing them, like, it's a restaurant on a fucking app. It's like a trip advisor, and then, like, leaving them five-star reviews for what he supposed to be a spell that's casted for me to be incapacitated so that that's the only way that I can love him back. However, she definitely knew that he was spiraling. And that is because he would also message Maya the articles on how to be great submissive wife. So there was this email thread from November that is very revealing of just the power that Larry thought he had and how Maya was not about this at all. On November the 24th, 2020, Maya sent an email to Larry after Larry sent her link to the article that was titled What Men Want From Their Wives. Maya's response was, how about maybe you focus on what also women want from their husbands? All these things you send me are just about you, which further solidifies the whole idea that you really think I'm the problem, and that if you could fix me, everything will be okay. As long as I go back to the wife you liked, the one who didn't rock the boat, who didn't assert her feelings, who didn't care about how much she was hurting, so long as there's peace and harmony, then things will be okay. Because really, I'm the problem, right? According to the arrest warrant, this is also the time when the following internet searches will be found on Larry's devices. Plant you take to never wake up. Water hemlock. My wife doesn't want me to touch her. And then he searched for a bunch of drugs that affect the central nervous systems that are sedatives, depressants, and according to the DEA, 
one of them is actually commonly referred to as a date rape drug. By December of 2020, Maya and Larry were sleeping in separate bedrooms, and while she knew about some of the red flags that I'm telling you, she didn't know about all of it. However, in the bedroom where she slept, under the bed she found a speaker. Apparently, Larry was playing subliminal messages designed to make Maya desire him and only him. The one playing under her bed was titled No More Men. Maya confronted Larry and he admitted he had done it. Shortly after, she texted a friend and said, my marriage is definitely over. By December of 2020, Maya and Larry were sleeping in separate rooms. Little says Maya found speakers in her room and confronted Larry. He admitted he had been playing subliminal messages while she slept. Maya messaged a friend and said her marriage was definitely over. What was that message that was coming out of those speakers under the bed? It's right there. No, no more, more men. men. No more men. On New Year's weekend, Maya told her family her decision. She's ready for divorce. She's finally made up her mind. I just told her, just be careful. Just be careful. On January 7th, the last day she was heard from, Maya filled out this form and made an appointment with a divorce attorney. I think she told him that she was going to file for divorce. He snapped when he found out that he was finally losing her. This is a sideline, right? But men will shit on women who are into astrology, who are into buying crystals, energy work, all of that stuff. And then they will do this. They will do this. It seems like someone's projecting a midlife crisis. Like, his wife is doing everything normal. Like, just living her life. And he's like, she is going for a midlife crisis. Meanwhile, you are online ordering spells. Sir, sir, it's just because I'm a spiteful bitch, right? I lie in this bed, this very bed, at night, when I research these cases, and I'm just imagining this guy in prison for allegedly murdering his wife. And his cellmates reacting to this information. It's like, no, 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 I am innocent of the murder of my wife. However, yeah, what cannot be disproven <laughs> are my Google searches and uh, my spellcasting era. It doesn't seem very alpha. I don't know. I might be completely wrong. It doesn't seem like very much of a thing to be in jail for and like the Sally is finding out that information. Like a lot of people believe his motive was that his ego was damaged because his wife wanted to leave him. And something tells me again, going through therapy, getting a divorce, getting a woman that actually wants to sleep with you and doesn't know that you are a psycho yet, or maybe you cure the psycho side, something tells me that would have done leaps and miles for your ego. Mm, 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 a thought, a thought, think about it. Think about it. We've done a lot more about someone's ego than you doing all of this bullshit, than actually committing crime, allegedly, possibly murdering your wife, and then your cellmates learning about your spell casting days because a woman didn't want to sleep with you and because you were a psycho. Something tells me, not super alpha, Gonna might, might get beaten up in prison as you um, allegedly deserve, as Larry allegedly deserves. So, Back in our story, after sleeping in separate rooms, Larry playing subliminal messages to his wife, Maya has finally had it. And on New Year's Eve 2020, she knew she wanted to leave. On the last day that anybody had seen her alive, January the 7th, she filed for a divorce and arranged to meet with a lawyer. As we know, in obsessive cases or those of domestic violence, the time the person decides to leave is usually when they're most at risk because the other party will believe they lost control over you, they won't be able to cope with it. A story so far is that Larry became possessive, Maya filed for a divorce, and he snapped. He kills her in the house the night of the 7th, morning of the 8th, he creates an alibi and dips for 12 hours. To prove any of it, to have enough probable cause to get further warrants, the police needed an in. And that's how we circle back to those weapons. Because in taking steps to distance herself from her husband, Maya gave the police the probable cause. Once her communications with the family and friends were reviewed, police uncovered the January the 6th message to a friend. 
I told him I'm filing for divorce, whether he likes it or not. I'm done trying to make it amicable for the sake of the kids. Maya continued by stating that she was really hoping to get through this weekend first for her daughter's birthday. January the 7th, Maya speaks with the law firm at 12.15 in the afternoon, and she arranges an appointment with the divorce attorney for Tuesday, January the 12th. Again, take in mind, like, her daughter's birthday is on the 10th, she wants everything to be amicable for her daughter's birthday, and then she's going to head for the divorce. She specifically wanted to wait to initiate the divorce until after the daughter's birthday. Her phone call, so the last phone call on January the 7th, was at 3.48 p.m. with a divorce attorney. Her last known communication with anybody would be a family friend through Facebook Messenger, and this would be at 8.15 p.m., and this was when she shared an ad for a toy hauler with a family member. Because you now have a full picture with how controlling Larry was, I need to point you to a specific part of the arrest warrant that we already discussed. So, I feel it's just important going back to certain things, right, to see, like, them in hindsight, of like, oh, okay, no, this sounds, like, completely different when we actually have the full picture. So, this is the part where, again, he speaks about, like, the wife being, like Maya being in the house on the 8th, but they have had the argument on the 7th, and since then he, you know, went on the beach, and then, like, he had heard Maya in the house, but had not seen her. Again, in hindsight, totally normal behavior for somebody who is super possessive, controlling every single move of hers, knowing where she is at all times. Then, deleting of the messages prior to January the 9th. Also, totally normal behavior when you love your wife so much. He actually stated that he deleted the messages once the police obviously faced him with this to conserve the space on his cell phone. You know, the first thing to go when your memory is full. It's not like the audiobook you downloaded, like the Netflix episodes of the show. No, absolutely not. The whole message history that you have had with somebody for 21 years is the logical delete option. Again, in hindsight, when you know the control this man had had over his wife. A very, very suspicious move. Other suspicious movements pop up back in our timeline with Maya phoning a divorce attorney and messaging her family in the evening. Knowing that she's going forward with a divorce, Larry is going desperate. And we know this because he deleted texts with his wife to save the phone memory, but he didn't delete email exchanges between him and spellcasters. Again, a very crucial mistake. And to me, I, just, I don't know what you think about this, because why? Why not delete then the emails? Like, yeah, everything could have been recovered to a certain degree, but why did he not delete the emails? Like, that is just so bizarre to me. Like, did he genuinely think, like, oh, no, nobody's gonna look through my emails and find out that I have been casting spells on my wife for the past couple of months? Okay, let's speak about this, right? So, January the 7th. So, this is the afternoon that we know Maya had returned to the house. She was last seen alive on that day and last heard from family and friends. As Maya is making a phone call to the divorce attorney arranging the appointment right after her daughter's birthday, Larry is sending the emails to the spellcasters. I think she wants me to snap. I'm shaking inside, ready to snap. At 4.39 p.m., he sends an email asking a spellcaster, make her realize that we are meant to be with each other, make her miserable without me, make her want to sleep on the same bed for all eternity, praying hands emoji. Then I think one of them probably responds, like, yeah, that's all possible, can you, like, send us proof of income or something like that? Because at 9.21 p.m., he sends a screenshot of his account balance from one of the cryptocurrency applications to his two daughters. Again, I don't know why that would be, unless he's proving that he has enough money to pay them if they do this. We know now, right, in our timeline, Maya's phone activity stops on January the 8th at 1.20 5 a.m., so, like, early morning hours. About an hour later, Larry sends one email to a spellcaster. So, 2.36 a.m., he sends an email, and then, weirdly, coincidentally, after this time, Larry's pleas to spellcasters stop. I really thought I said everything on this channel. The sentence, please, 
to a spellcaster stop, I somehow never thought I will say that. I somehow never thought that will leave my mouth, but he does. He doesn't send another email to a spellcaster until January the 9th at 5.55 a.m. This is when he asked the spellcaster to remove or stop hexing his wife, May. The focus is going to shift and he is going to start asking the spellcasters to instead hex the man with whom Maya had an affair. As of January the 9th, Larry does not direct any more spells or hexes towards May, nor does he make any more requests for assistance with his crumbling marriage. Sir, sir, it sounds like somebody's creating an alibi. It's, uh, somehow it makes it worse. Somehow him asking for the hexes to stop makes it worse. It's like when somebody is crumbling and he's just like thinking like, what will make my story work? What will make the plausible work? Think of a man, a man. She must have been having an affair. I don't have zilch of evidence. There's nothing. I don't have the name of the man. I don't have any information because the man does not exist. There's a man. Hex the man instead. Hex the man instead. The time has come to tie it all together and get to May of 2021. The other piece of evidence, other than having the amount of weapons and the cover-up of the illegal ones connect to the disappearance, was a recording from a neighbor's house. The same neighbor that had a recording with the young kids outside in the backyard playing late at night when it was cold. This was an audio-only recording of nine loud bangs that sounded like gunshots. The loud bangs were at 10 p.m. and then the kids were heard playing outside at 10.30 p.m. Let's listen to it before we break it down. The neighbors, do they say, oh yeah, we heard gunshots? Yeah, not only did they tell me that they've got gunshots, but they've got the audio. A home surveillance system from the neighbor captured these loud bangs around 10 p.m. that night. <laughs> Little also believes they are gunshots. It's coming from Larry and Maya's house. Remember, Billy Little had tracked down that other home security footage that police agreed captured audio of the Miliette kids playing in the backyard at 10.30 p.m. <laughs> picture is becoming more and more clear. He's got to clean up and he's got to move the body, so he needs to send those kids outside on the school night at 10.30. The FBI did actually analyze this audio and they were unable to definitely say that these were gunshots. They said they could not scientifically be classified as gunshot events due to the audio quality. The neighbor was able to say that they did recognize the children's voices as the Miliette children, However, they knew something was wrong when they were out that late at night. The combination of Larry possessing an illegal weapon and the possible gunshot sounds resulted in, on May the 7th, 2021, police serving Larry with a gun violence restraining order. According to the order, Larry was to surrender his firearms to the law enforcement in an immediate and safe manner. Larry did not comply with the order and the search warrant was served at the Miliette house for the sole purpose of collecting all of the firearms, firearm parts, and ammunition. This happened because the illegal assault weapon they found on January the 23rd, 2021, constituted a felony in the state of California. The detectives were able to seize three out of four missing firearms, if you remember the ones that he had placed at his uncle's house, but Larry had acquired two more registered Glock handguns and an unregistered firearm, so they seized all of the extra weapons that he purchased in the meantime for whatever reason. The one gun that remained outstanding is a Smith & Wesson 40 caliber handgun, and this weapon had never been located. Obviously, I put in the script, possibly a murder weapon, question mark, but also why is he getting more guns? In my opinion, he might be getting more guns so that the police gets confused and he's like, no, no, there's no gun missing, right? Right, as if like they're not gonna be registered to his name, as if they're not gonna find out if like there's another weapon that is illegal. Just check registration details. I don't know what is the thought process of getting more guns in the meantime. Possibly because what he what did he get? 
He got two more Glocks and an unregistered firearm. So again, it doesn't match three, doesn't match the four guns that are at his uncle's house. I don't know what this man's logic is. Why is he moving mad? Why is he moving like this? Anyways, with all of these details so far, let us recap the story of Maya's disappearance, painted for us in an arrest warrant, so it's like in chronological order. We have Larry for the last couple of months of Maya's life turning to spellcasters online every single day, being in touch with them, spending money and throwing hexes on his wife. He was controlling her every move and there was no indication that he is going to stop. The last day that Maya was heard from, the last day of her life, she filled out an evaluation online form, made the appointment with the divorce attorney, she had been searching for how much mortgage rent she could afford on a new place and how much child support she would expect. Then we have the audio of the possible gunshots at 10 p.m. January the 7th, audio of Mireta kids in the backyard at 10.30 the same evening, pictures of Larry's weapons, picture of a son surrounded by the weapons, one of the weapons could not be accounted for, still to this day cannot be accounted for. Larry then driving away after putting something in his car and being absent for 12 hours, his phone being switched off, him not participating in any searches, airing out the house and acting suspicious as hell in the aftermath of his wife's disappearance, and finally, and most concerningly, him not needing spells any longer. All of that led to October the 19th, 2021, the Chula Vista Police Department holding a press conference. They announced the arrest of Larry Miliete for the first-degree murder of his wife Maya. Technically, because the charge is premeditated murder, they could charge him with a death penalty. The state of California has not executed any inmates in a very long time. While it is legal in this state, the current and the previous governor is opposed. Today at 11.42 a.m., the Chula Vista Police Department SWAT team arrested Larry Maliette for the murder of his wife. And with that, even more evidence came to light. My sister did not him. She gave him three kids. <laughs> In a press conference, San Diego County District Attorney Summer Steffen laid out some of the details of the months-long law enforcement investigation. In homicide cases, there is often a triggering event. In this case, the last call recorded that May made was to a divorce attorney. The district attorney said at the press conference that in these cases, there are sometimes triggering events. She said that on the 7th, Maya called a divorce attorney at 3.48 p.m. and made the appointment. She got home at 4.42 p.m. and there were no images of her ever leaving the house of her own accord. Law enforcement believes that Larry had been unraveling for almost a year. He believed his wife was having an affair and did not want to lose her. They also believe he shot her to death that night and put the kids in the backyard to get them out of the way while he cleaned up inside. Then the next morning, he put Maya's body in the Lexus. He had backed into the garage and drove out of the neighborhood with her. His little boy was with him that day as well. The day Maya went missing, Larry sent countless emails to spellcasters. However, not one was sent after the 9th. After a year without Maya and her husband behind bars, the Help with Maya community has created merchandise, held vigils, rallies, and raised more than $50,000 for search efforts. They put QR codes and flyers for people to scan for more information and to recruit volunteers. I will let the family tell you about the search, and it helps to have a visual of just what they're faced with, the terrain that they're faced with every single weekend that they search these areas. Energized with new information that had come out after Larry's arrest, Aleda Vaughn was part of that search. The thing that this case really needed was to be able to know where to search. That was the problem here. You can't just search the entire world. Where are we right now? It's a hot spot that Larry could have brought Miles body out here. Like Billy Little, investigators obtained footage that showed Larry leaving the house in the couple's Lexus 
for almost 11 and a half hours the day after his wife was last heard from. They analyzed the car's navigation system. According to the information that we have now, he was about two and a half hours out from his house when he put his address in. Somewhere two and a half hours away from his house, Larry had entered his address to find his way back home. That information was enough to center the searches on places Larry was familiar with, like this desert area where he and Maya had gone hiking. What are you specifically looking for as you comb this area? At this point, fortunately, I hate to say, but we're probably just looking for clothing or bones. Over the months, droves of volunteers have responded to her family's calls to the community and have joined Team Maya. We're just so thankful and blessed to have everybody here. Are you free together? I'm San Diego City retired firefighter. I got a team and we go out and we systematically cover areas where someone could possibly hide a body and it's you know it's very sad to even talk about but you have to do it and it's the the proverbial needle in a haystack why are you here today uh really just to support our family hopefully we can bring peace to the family always make sure you've got eyes on somebody what drives you to do this for a total stranger somebody you didn't even know i i felt that it should be a community effort you just want closure for this family so much and that's why we're out here that's why we keep coming they deserve it. I've also done my googling to help with the visual, to help display for us the visual through the maps, so like sort of like satellite view into the areas. So we have the beaches, right, that Larry mentions, we have the Torrey Pines State Beach and then Solano Beach up to the north. And then the family searched a lot of the sideways areas where he could have driven. So I'm going to put a couple of maps on the screen based off of what I could find. And these are the areas that the volunteers and the family had already searched from what we know. So they're going off the basis of a couple of things. One being that Maya's phone had not left the household while it was switched on, so clearly she didn't leave of her own accord. The second and the crucial part of how they're figuring out the radius is that Larry put his home address into the navigation system at 3.29 p.m. So the searches are based on that time looking into the areas in the radius of where he put his home address. I'm going to let Jeannie's writing take over here to explain the rationale behind the searches and then I'm going to hit you with my own comments. Back on January the 26th, 2021, during one of the search warrants, they seized the contents of Larry's vehicle, the Lexus GX460 infotainment system. That is the navigation system very similar to a GPS for your car. Apparently, the day Larry disappeared for over 11 hours on the 8th, when he was two and a half hours away from his home, so towards the end of his journey, he put his address in to find a way home. The system did not capture any additional locations or routes traveled that day. To explain, when Larry was on his way home that day, he got lost, or at the very least turned around. He put his home address in the navigation system and it directed him home and showed that he was two and a half hours away from his house. Now, I know you are wondering how a navigation system can tell you the route home without knowing where you are. At the time, it was entirely possible that the navigation system did use GPS to see where the vehicle was and plot the best route home. It just didn't save that information. All it saved was that when he was lost, he used it and he was somewhere two and a half hours away from home. Larry swore he had his cell phone with him that day, but later backtracked and said that he forgot it at home. And we know that... Basically, like, the cell phone was switched off, so they don't have any data from it to, like, pinpoint his location at 3.29 p.m. when he put his home address. I need a car expert in the comments pronto, because how is this possible? You know, like, with GPS, like, the way that I usually see it, it's like a mapped out route. So maybe even if you don't have a pinpoint of the location at 3.29 p.m. when he input his home address... Like, wouldn't you have at least a route so, like, roughly you would know where he was at? And also something I was thinking is mileage. 
can the system, like in the car, can we not get the information of the mileage at like 6 a.m. and then compare it to 6 p.m.? Can that not be done? Because like we have smart cars these days, it just baffles me that we don't know how many miles this man had traveled that day, that we don't know like what location he has been on, like it baffles me that he's getting away on something where we should have some evidence he was in a car, like a modern day car. Can somebody let me know, like, what am I missing? Can you not track mileage, the beginning and the end of the day? Can you not track at least, like, mapped out route? Can any of this information come during trial? It just drives me fucking nuts. So, I'll put the map so what I could find was searched, but we are talking abandoned areas, like golf courses that were shut down, deserted locations that have been searched. There is always logic to the areas that are searched, what personally I think still, after looking in depth based on his car navigation system not revealing anything, is that if Levy is the culprit, he knew of the disposal site. Like, he had at least a rough idea in mind. What I mean by that is, maybe not, like, spot X on the Mission Trails open space, right? But Mission Trails open space as a location. So, like, maybe not, like, a specific spot in this, like, very deserted area, but, like, the deserted area in itself. Meaning somebody else knows something. Either a friend or a family member. Like, his friends and family have been very quiet, which, you know, no surprise there. But somebody must have either heard this man mention this place, or they knew that the family went there at some point. He must have slipped up. This is who I would appeal to. The friends, the family, or also dig more into his... Google history into the Google Drive, like, of the pictures and the videos of where the family had gone recently. This man gave us a step-by-step -step guide of what he had done on the 7th, 8th, and 9th. We have, like, history of all of the emails with the spellcasters. He couldn't resist communicating with them, even in the aftermath of the events. In my mind, he's simply not smart enough not to have slipped up when it came to the alleged disposal of his wife's body. One last comment, looking at the maps, there is just so much of open space reserve, national parks, county preserves, which is why I wonder during the trial if the interviews they had had with his four-year-old son are going to come to public, they're going to come out. As to see, like, how long he would have been out of the car on this road trip. Did the son play games? So, that, that is something that is, like, in my head constantly. Was there a second device in the car? Because, like, how do you engage a four-year-old these days? You kind of just give them a phone, like, they get lost playing games, they completely get lost of like, the space and the time, like, where they're at, they will just, like, completely forget everything, and then you come back in the car, and you're like, ah, just give me, like, the phone, like, you have played games enough, like, they don't have the concept of time when they're four. So, if not a device, right, if there was no second device, if his son was not, like, on the phone playing games or watching something, like, was it a very long drive to, again, one of the places where the family would off-road and then they went to the beach so the son wouldn't be frustrated or suspicious, or the other way around, where they had gone to the beach and then he said, like, oh, yeah, let's just do, like, one of our off-roading trips. I stand by my gut feeling here that he had to balance out the stay on the beach with the ride, because he is in a car with a four-year-old, who at any point can become aware of what is happening. And if convicted, I have to spell this out, the truth of what was happening meant a son was in a car of his dad when he was disposing of his mother's body. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and What those children will go through, all those moments in life when they need their mom and she's not going to be there, it breaks my heart. In January 2022, Maya's family and friends held a vigil to mark the one-year anniversary of her disappearance. There's somebody out there that knows something, that's seen something. They should come forward. Have it in your heart to help us bring him home.
If you have any information about Maya Miljeta's whereabouts, please call the Chula Vista hotline. I will put the number on the screen and then also in the pinned comment. And you can also go to helpfindmaya.com to sign up for searches in Southern California or donate to the cost of the search. To end the saga of Larry Miljeta and this dipshit, as to where this case stands now. I'm recording this end of September, okay? Just so you know where we are at. Like, if there's any updates, I'm going to put them in the pinned comment and also, like, you can let me know in the comments below. Since Larry's arrest, the Miljeta children have been living with Larry's parents in the family home in Chula Vista. Larry has been held with no bail since his arrest. The family has organized many volunteer men searches in that two and a half hour radius, focusing on areas the family visited previously, but a lot of it is desert. Larry had a lot of time to dispose of her body, but the family has not given up. They have continued to search. Not long after Maya's disappearance, Larry cut off all contact between her family and the kids. However, in November of 2021, after nine months of no contact, Maya's family members were granted visitation with the children. He has also been denied motion to speak with his kids from jail. He fought to be in touch with them because being estranged from his kids is affecting his mental health. I can't make this shit up. Let me just play this video. It's Larry's world in his head. His mental health is something we should be very concerned about. Really, it has affected his well-being mentally and emotionally. The fact that Larry Miliete has been court-ordered not to speak to his children from jail is taking a toll on the 41-year-old father of three, according to his defense attorney, Bonita Martinez. He's actually quite distressed, if you might want to say depressed about it. The attorney argued in court Thursday that the protective order should be lifted, allowing Miliete to contact his kids ages 6, 11, and 13. Currently, he is only allowed to write letters to the children, which are screened before being delivered. The children have expressed to me how much they miss their father. Deputy District Attorney Christy Bowles reminded the court that Miliete's telephone privileges were revoked after he repeatedly called his children at all hours discussing the murder case and bad-mouthing Maya's family. Then, after being court-ordered not to call anybody except his attorney, Bull said he used another inmate's PIN number to make more calls. There were 66 attempted calls to the defendant's parents, his aunt, his brother, and his boss. And I think to allow the defendant to communicate with the children would be to their detriment. They are victims and, frankly, witnesses in this case. That's when the defense attorney turned to a different line of argument targeting the alleged victim. He, in fact, was the one taking care of the children. And the mother was out there drinking in up early morning, coming home drunk. And he's the one that stayed with the children soliciting a rather strong reaction from Maya's sister, Mary Chris, who was watching the hearing on a remote feed. She left them for at least over two months. She left without even taking the children with her. In the end, the judge denied the motion, meaning Larry Miliete is still prohibited from speaking with his kids. Everyone who knows of this story, and I believe like even if this is your first time hearing this story, you probably have a problem with the kids being with his parents. Because if he badmouthed Maya to her own family, you know, calling her adulterous whore and all of that, what do you think he was saying to his? And now what do you think those kids are hearing from his own family? Like the lies that are being fed to them. And also meaning the thoughts, especially the youngest kid has of his mom, are now replaced by lies, by just fake truths that the dad's family must have put in his head. I feel for those kids so much because whatever the real story is, they lost both of their parents. There is just also the outcome where one parent took the life of the other and for his own agenda is now acting as a victim, manipulating those children and not having their best interest at heart. 
What I'm going to play next is the last bit that we have at the time of this recording, about Larry's attorney possibly stepping down and the hearing for the guardianship of the kids and his own trial taking place within the same month. And here's just a tip, just before I play this video, okay, Larry, if you're listening, which you're not because you're in jail, um, when you're balding, okay, when you get to the midlife crisis, right, and when you start balding, putting your hair, like sticking it up, like putting as much gel into your hair and then like putting it down, like, you know, pulling it back as much as possible, maybe it just makes that balding patch more prominent. Just a tip, just a tip. You know, we know all of the hairstyles work on you. We know it, just, just a tip here. Okay, let's watch this video. Court uh, sets a review hearing. It started out as a routine hearing to set a trial date in the court battle over guardianship of Maya Miliate's three children. No cameras were allowed in probate court. This video is from a previous hearing. The judge did set a trial date for the guardianship case for January 5th. The same month, Maya's husband, Larry Miliate, is set to go on trial in criminal court for the alleged murder of his wife. That's when the unexpected happened. An opposing attorney suggested there would be no conflict between the two trials because Larry's defense attorney would soon be stepping down from the murder case. The defense attorney, Benita Martinez, then stood up and told the judge if she was, quote, relieved from the case, it would be for financial reasons because Larry can't afford to pay her. Earlier this month, the same probate judge ordered the Miliete home in Chula Vista to be sold on the open market, and some of that money could end up going to Larry's defense attorney. All funds from the proceeds of the sale of the residence are to be placed in a blocked account until uh, it can be determined which part belongs to Ms. Miliete and which part belongs to Mr. Miliete. Outside court, I asked Larry's attorney if she was indeed stepping down from the murder case. She told me if there was no money to pay her legal fees, quote, I will have no choice but to resign from the case, but also added, quote, Larry would have to be found indigent or unable to afford an attorney before a public defender could take over the case. The defense attorney also suggested another option. If county funds could be used to pay her legal fees, she would not have to step down. Within the last month, September of 2023, Mary Chris has petitioned for guardianship of Maya's kids. If there are any news on this by the time I release this video, I will put it in the pinned comment as I'm recording it end of September, but both trials should take place in January of 2024. This week, a judge ordered that the Chula Vista Miliete home be sold and the proceeds be put in a trust for the children. The house had gone into foreclosure, so it was either debt or an auction. This way, the trust can manage the funds for the kids. They will be living either with Larry's parents or Mary Chris and Richard, pending the outcome of the guardianship hearing. Regarding the murder trial, though they have not found Maya's body, the prosecution held a 10-day pre-trial hearing and the judge ruled there was sufficient evidence for him to proceed to trial. Currently, he has still been denied bail and is scheduled to be tried for Maya's murder in January of 2024. What keeps me up at night, like some final thoughts here, sometimes I think about the defense that people like Larry might use. And one of them that I first thought, I was like, okay, what if he was, because he pled not guilty, right? Of course he did. If he was to plead guilty, he would have to reveal the location of the body. And then obviously, like, every single argument that he had had about, like, his whole alibi story wouldn't work. So I don't think that is going to happen because I feel like he will stick to the no body, no crime defense. And if sticking to not guilty in my head, like, what his lawyer will probably try to prove is that the police never looked into anybody else, and that his wife left on her own, because obviously she was cheating with this imaginary man, with this man that he had conjured up in his head. She was a party girl, like, look elsewhere kind of thing, right? Like, reasonable doubt. Which is not reasonable in this case at all, because this man gave the police and the public step by step on how he did it. 
I've just never seen a case where something just flows. Like, every piece of evidence that Billy Little had discovered just fit into the story. It was like, yep, yeah, that's the next step. This man had just painted a picture. I don't think that this will be the case where there would be enough reasonable doubt for the jury. And also the she just left, right? Like she went hiking, she just left. It just doesn't make for a lengthy argument because it's like, oh, she left on her own, any questions? Like, yeah. Explain all of the circumstantial evidence. Why is there a missing gun? The lack of evidence of her parting and cheating. Like all of the movements on the day. Explain why you suddenly stopped hexing your wife and focused on the unknown man you never mentioned before. As Billy Little says, you don't get to get away with murder because you are good at hiding a body. And if he doesn't get away with murder, if he is convicted, he is facing 25 to life. With his Sally, is learning all about his spellcasting adventures, which as a spiteful bitch, you know, makes me generally happy when alpha males end up in jail and they realize they're not as alpha as they might have been thinking they were. What also went through my head, and I don't know the legalities of this, okay? Again, hit me up in the comments. But why can we not show this guy the searches that have been done and the areas that have been searched as he's tied to heart monitor? Like, those can't be that pricey. I don't know the legalities of it, that's the thing, like the ethical side of things. But can we, like, appeal for that? Can we plug him to a heart monitor and then be like, okay, so the family had searched these areas, and if his heart rate is up, then we know that the family is actually getting closer. Because what are the legalities of it? Can we do it? Can, can it be done? Like, his heart rate might lead us to Maya, to Maya's body, and then there is just absolutely no justification. If they find the body, like, we will know the cause of death, we will know the matter of death. Like, even if it is just deserted area, and at this point, yes, the family had said they're looking, unfortunately, for bones, still, you can tell them the cause of death, you can tell them the impact on that body, you can tell them the time of death, it will literally nail this man down. Let us end this story remembering the charitable person that Maya was. A devoted mother who would move mountains for her three children. We have unfortunately seen plenty of cases like these where the perpetrator exhibits control over someone like Maya, to no fault of her own, treating them as their possession, where they won't reveal the location of their victim unless they're the one to benefit from it. Maya Milieta disappeared when she was 39 years old, leaving her three children behind. But what is clear in everyone's mind is that she would never have done it of her own accord. She has some videos with her son singing with her. Word by word. Yeah. Word by word.